My name is Claire McGee and I'll be your host um, for today's webinar and you're all very welcome to this morning's session, Creating Digital Media, Creating Digital Marketing Strategy brought to you by Armagh City, Banbridge and Craig Avon Council and delivered by Innovate NI. For those of you who are social media savvy, we're on Twitter and Instagram today using hashtag transform your business program. So this webinar is the final one in the series of practical business support webinars that form part of the Council's Transform Your Business program, which officially comes to a close today. Um, Transform Your Business provided tailored business support to 425 businesses since it started in March 2021. Um, and in essence, that was approximately over 8,000 hours of mentoring support to businesses in the borough. It was managed by the Council and delivered in partnership with Innovate NI and the programme was part funded by Invest Northern Ireland and the European Regional Development Fund under the Investment for Growth and Jobs Northern Ireland programme. It enabled you as a local business to access essential business knowledge, expertise and impartial advice through the provision of one-to-one -one mentoring, signposting, access to workshops and networking opportunities. Um, so we're really delighted today um, to have Cassie Jane Buckley with us, um, who um, is going to have a look at the digital marketing strategy to ensure every bit of the time and energy and sanity that you have going forward is going into the marketing that brings you closer to the, your overall arching business goals. Um, so during today's session, Cassie will guide you um, to deep dive into the business goals, identifying the right audiences, channels and content you need to make the most um, and the most impact um, in, in the least amount of time within the business. And so a bit about Cassie, she's a social media strategist and founder of Made in Media. It's a digital marketing agency, which she launched um, mid pandemic um, after several years of working in diversity and inclusion with Oxford University Press. Cassie is also a guest lecturer with Queen's University Belfast and Oxford Brookes University in the UK. And her mission really is to make um, your life as a business owner, um, as a hardworking business owner, easy by enabling you to create an authentic brand that your community will love and most importantly buy from you. So I'm going to pass the driving seat now over to Cassie. Um, so Cassie, um, if I can just ask you to come on camera and share your screen. Hi everyone, thanks for being here today. So I'm passing the driving seat over to Cassie, so buckle yourselves in um, and good luck. We will be back. We aim to be finished up for around 11, quarter past 11. Remember to put all your questions um, into the Q&A facility that we have available. And as much as time allows, we'll put your questions to Cassie at the end. Um, so I'll see you all back here shortly. Brilliant. Thank you, Claire. Uh, so Hi guys, my name is Cassie. Uh, thank you, Claire, for that introduction. Um, saves me from, from repeating myself. So I am here to talk to you today about digital marketing strategy. Now that is a bit of a combination of buzzwords. What do we mean by digital marketing strategy? Well, 
the way that the world is moving forward, having an online presence is a necessary evil. I'm sorry to say, and it doesn't just stop at social media anymore. We've got so many other channels that can really um, propel us forward in our businesses and get us reaching new people, new customers, new sales and bookings. So what we're going to do today is give you a solid formula that you can take away yourselves, walk yourself through and put together what your, is your digital marketing strategy. And you'll see how that formulates as we go through. But first of all, I just wanted to talk a little bit first about the, the overall role of digital marketing. So there's a couple of different ways how we can approach digital marketing and what we want to do with them. Now, the point of having a strategy is, as Claire mentioned, we are going to be starting with an overarching business goal. So a goal for your business moving forward, uh, what your current priority is, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But we also have then our digital marketing goals that come into that. So there's a couple of different ones. We've got brand awareness. So first of all, do you just want everyone to know who you are? Uh, you know, you can... Imagine brands like Coca-Cola or Red Bull will do this. They're putting millions and millions into just brand awareness campaigns that will naturally convert to sales, but sales isn't their number one goal. It's getting the brand out there and making sure everyone knows who they are and that they're the leaders in that market. So the best thing about the different types of channels with digital marketing is that you can create a platform uh, to promote your work globally with no geographical barriers, especially with things like social media. Um, that can grow as much as your business grows. So it's a really um, organic growth process that you can go through with these different channels. But one of the uh, other, um, sorry, I just saw a Q and A, so I just um, thought I'd check on the slides are gonna be shared afterwards. Um, so then we have the community building, which I think is one of the most underrated um, goals for social media, because obviously, um, you're going to be putting your brand out there, but we don't want to be billboards. We want to be creating spaces where we can really nurture um, a good group of loyal customers, a good community. So whilst you want your brand to be out there and putting names, your name out there and promoting all the wonderful things you're doing, you also want to keep people interested and personally invested in the business and the growth of it. So things like social media or email marketing are really good spaces to really harness that, that loyalty from people and get people to be your own spokespeople as well for your business. And then we've got sales driver. Now, obviously we're in businesses, we wanna make money and sometimes people forget about that with their marketing. They get so fixated on making sure that they're ticking all the boxes that they forget at the un underlying goal here is to, for us to be making some money. Uh, so we want to make sure that we are driving those sales with a really good balance of the first two goals. So making sure people know who we are, we have that brand awareness, people hear what we're doing and we're saying how fabulous we're all doing it, but then we're keeping people in as well. And we want people to be really invested in what we're doing. And so once people get that investment, then they start looking at your content more, they get interested, they'll look at your website. And that's when that real conversion process starts happening and we start turning followers into customers. So it's that um, old theory, you know, of how you need to look at an ad seven times before you decide to buy. And that's where this comes into play. You have the ad out there, but then you have that community space to keep people in. So they keep seeing what you're doing in different and interesting ways. And that's when they convert into being a customer, a client, or however you wanna um, present them. So how this strategy is going to be broken down, we're going to start with your goals. As I said, we're going to, I've just got a few guiding questions on the slides that you can ask yourselves either now or to work on later of how to structure um, your formula uh, yourselves. So this is the exact process. When I sit down one-on-one -on -one with a client to talk about their digital marketing strategy, these are the exact questions that I ask them to get all the information that I need to put that uh, strategy together. So it's going to start with your goals. We're going to talk about your story. So what it is about your business that makes it different and what messages you want to convey to your audience. Then we're looking at your community. So who it is you actually want to be talking to. And then your channels. And picking your channels will um, very much determine, uh, be determined by those first couple of factors. Um, and then your content. So a few different ways 
and ideas that you can think up of what content that you want to be putting out. So it's going to be quite structured. So first of all, we want to talk about your goals. Now, this is the basic foundation that you want on any strategy, whether you're doing digital marketing or just a social media strategy or a paid ad strategy, you need to have your business goals sorted first. Now, sometimes when I ask clients, what are your business goals? They don't have an answer straight away because they haven't necessarily thought about it. That's absolutely fine. It's sometimes great to have a clean slate to reflect on what it is that you want um, to do for your business and how you want your business to move forward. So again, here are just a few guiding questions. What's the ultimate mission of the business? Like, what are you trying to accomplish? Um, is there a mission side of your business that you really want to propel forward, whether it be education um, or charity, but even, you know, are you trying to convert people, change hearts and minds to try a new products or to try a new service? What is it that you're trying to provide? What's the value that you're trying to provide for people? And in terms of how you convert that into your revenue for your business, what, what is that goal? Um, or what is the business's current priority? So are you opening a new site soon? Or are you refurbing a new site? Do you need to think about a relaunch campaign? What have you got? What milestones have you got coming up in the next, let's say, even year um, that you really want to focus on and uh, get your messaging really crystal clear on? And what do we need to be doing now to achieve our medium to long-term goals? So this can be anything. If I have a client who say is a is a therapist a child therapist for instance and at the minute she's just taking home visits but she really wants to see uh, have her own space her own office um, or therapy room in a building in town and she needs to raise x amount in order to achieve that what's that long-term goal and what can we be doing in our messaging to easily transition into that we no don't want to be cutting ourselves short or, or even boxing ourselves in in the messaging that we're saying now so then we need to completely change in future obviously there are rooms for adjusting and pivoting but what can we be doing now to slowly build our messaging into what those long-term goals are going to be so again a few guiding questions uh it's, it is generally great to have some business goals in mind for your own mindset and to be able to work towards something but whenever you're doing any kind of uh, digital marketing strategy or social media strategy, you really want to make sure you're putting them in at the at the forefront of what you're doing, because then everything that you're building out afterwards is always going to be bringing you back to that business goal. So if you're spending uh, your time on social media, creating content, um, hopefully by the end of this, you'll see how to create content quickly. But I know people who will spend less than maybe an hour a day trying to formulate one social media post you know that all of the time that you are spending, as Claire mentioned at the beginning, all of the time, energy and sanity that you're spending on your digital marketing, you know that it is coming back to that original business goal. So you are moving forward. You're not just posting and hoping for the sake of it. Now your story. This is really what we, all of the key messages that we want to convey to our community, what we want people to associate with us, what makes us different our brand values. There's lots of different ways that we can describe what it is, but I just like the idea of storytelling and you telling your story of your business and what it is that you're trying to achieve and how we can do that in a way that relates to the audience and the customers that you want to attract. So again, just a few guiding questions here. What key messages do you want to convey? So what are the top three things that either you provide or you do, um, or you want to be um, associated with. So for instance, if you have an accommodation um, in Belfast, what makes your accommodation different? Uh, what key qualities do you have that is different from other people? And what, what's your tagline? Things like that, just how could you, if you, even if you think about it as your 30 second pitch, your elevator pitch, um, what is it that makes your business your business um, summed up and what do you want your brand to be known for think of those key words that you want associated with your brand things like great customer service or fantastic food or um, you know efficient um, friendly family business what are those key attributes that you want associated with your business and then how can we weave that into all of our messaging going forward because this is ultimately what you want to do you want to make sure that any 
um, content, any copy that you're putting out is always coming back, you know, not repeating yourself, but these key messages are always in the underlying um, narrative that's going out. So you can really build this brand presence um, in the way that you want to be want to be seen. And obviously, what are your unique selling points? So what is what makes you different? So there's a lot of different um, ways that you can approach this, but really what you want are three key points that you, um, you know, even just three sentences that sum up what you do, how you do it differently and why you're doing it are really strong narratives in that storytelling piece going forward. Your community. So your community, your audience, your followers, there's lots of different ways that you can say it. I love to say community because it brings in a different mindset that like you're trying to nurture your community and get them invested in what you're doing. And I always would suggest having two to three different audiences or communities that you're trying to attract, mostly because you never know when something like a global pandemic could happen and wipe out an entire consumer behavior. So it's good just to have, <laughs> spread the risk a little bit it also is a great way to add variety to your content. If you're talking to the same person all the time, they might get a little bit um, fatigued from what you're talking about. So if you're able to switch it between a couple of different audiences, it automatically adds variety to your content as well. So you're not banging the same drum all the time um, and promoting to the same person. So having a little bit of a risk and there's um, spread of the risk. It's great to be able to have different um, types in terms of industries as well. So there's a few, again, guiding ideas of how you can segment um, these different uh, audiences. So there's the geographical considerations. So are you just looking locally or are you looking more um, nationally or internationally? So how is it that you are going to be attracting the people around you and therefore if you are local do you just want to be focusing on more local marketing rather than putting out paid ads that can go internationally and then looking at specific industries as well so is it you know are you looking at maybe a specific type of following like people who love makeup or beauty products or are you looking at um, people who have uh, specific hobbies like you can see here I've got a woman with a dog dog lovers is that a particular audience you could go it's just a different way to segment your audience to make sure that you are spreading that risk so now your channels and these are the different ways that you can actually use your digital marketing so you'll see that there's so many just give me one second I think my slide is Using slightly. Sorry about that. So now your channels, these are the different ways that you can be online. Um, so you can have social media, email marketing, different things like that. And we're going to go through them all. first one we're going to be looking at is your website and search engine optimization or SEO. Now SEO is how easily your website is found on search engines like Google. You can see that 60 to 70 percent of website traffic comes from Google. So whereas we are always talking about you know social media marketing, influencer marketing, email marketing, at the end of the day Google is still where it's strongest. So having a really good search engine optimization strategy is important. Now what do we mean by that? It means that you want to make sure that any keywords that are associated with your brand, whether it's your brand name or, you know, if you're a restaurant in, in Belfast, for instance, uh, an Italian restaurant, for instance, you want to make sure that if someone types in Italian restaurant Belfast, that you are one of the first people to pop up in that first page. Now, how do we do that? We want to make sure that our website is full of keywords that we want associated with us. So making sure that you have words like Italian restaurant and Belfast in your website to make sure they're completely optimized to get that boosting up. Now, 
it's great because other marketing channels can come into this and really help play a part. So for instance, with social media, if you have got the same brand names, the same imagery, all in line with your website and you've got connections between your website and your social media, all of the interactions you have on social media, such as liking, posting, commenting, um, you know, when other people are commenting on your stuff, all of those interactions create what I like to call Google points that all add up to your website's overall SEO and your brand's SEO. So it's a really great way that that channel can be a little bit more dynamic because your website isn't going to change too often. It's going to be quite static. Whereas your social media really builds up that um, dynamic interaction to be able to get that uh, go those Google points into your website. Another really handy way for this is to have a blog on your website, because obviously a blog is long form content, you know, it's, it's, it's an article essentially, but that's going to be full of keywords that you want associated with your brand. So even if it's something easy that you do once every two months and you have uh, five things to think about before hiring an interior designer, you have your little introduction, you have five points and you have your conclusion. That's going to be full of those really juicy keywords for your website. But those five things that you've put in your essay, those can be five social media posts that you drip feed throughout the next couple of weeks. So it's all about how you can create content, but use it in the most efficient way so that you can use all of your channels um, efficiently without needing to create content fresh each time. Social media. Now, social media is your personal favorite. It's where I started in digital marketing, um, but it's one that everyone hates the most. Um, <laughs> and I understand why, because it can be quite overwhelming. Even when I show this slide to my clients, they get quite overwhelmed very easily because there's so many channels there um, and probably even more that I haven't listed. But you have your obvious ones, the Instagram, Facebook or Meta, um, YouTube, LinkedIn, Pinterest, TikTok, Twitter and Clubhouse. Um, now, Clubhouse was... Um, an audio first platform that came out of COVID. It had a really good run for a little while, but since we've come back into um, the real world, uh, it's been, uh, been a little less prominent in terms of ch other channels. Um, now, the most important thing about when you're picking your social media channels is don't try to do everything, just do some things really well. So there's only gonna be the need to do maybe one or two channels when you're first starting out because a lot of the time these channels have multiple um, features on all of them. So Instagram, for instance, you have Instagram posts, Instagram stories, Instagram reels. There's lots of different ways that you can highlight what your business is doing. So you wanna make sure that you master one platform before going on to another. So the most common that I see with businesses are Instagram and Facebook. Quite easy as well, because you're able to cross post um, between the two of them through the Meta Business Manager. Um, if you have any questions about that, feel free to get in touch. Um, but these other ones are really coming in strong as well. The other thing to think about when you're picking your platforms is where your audience is. So once you have identified your audiences or your community um, from that previous slide, have a little look. Where are they spending most of their time? Are they, an, you know, are they a younger generation, this Gen Z that's coming up? Then you've got to be on TikTok, I'm sorry to tell you. Um, otherwise, are they a slightly older generation? Could Facebook be the platform for you? You want to make sure that you are going where your audience spends your time. The other and last thing to think about when you're trying to pick your platforms is what type of content you're happy to be creating and you're comfortable to create. If you're just looking at photographs and graphics, that's great. Instagram, Pinterest, um, which is obviously an image plat um, platform, uh, they're both great platforms for that. Are you happy with creating video content? If you are comfortable, then it's definitely worth trying TikTok, definitely worth trying Instagram Reels, or if you're doing longer form um, videos, YouTube as well. And then are you looking at more editorial, short form, written uh, content than Twitter? Twitter is a bit of an interesting one at the minute. Um, I don't know how well this webinar um, after link will age, but Twitter's changing daily with the takeover from Elon Musk. Um, so it's an interesting platform at the minute. Might not be worth trying straight away at the minute until things start to settle. 
Um, but it's uh, it's an interesting saga to keep on touch with. Um, so I do find um, most of my clients that I have in the North and in Ireland um, really just love Instagram and Facebook and really mastering those features first before moving on to something else. Paid social media ads. So paid advertising is a very interesting one. Um, again, a lot of these platforms all have their own um, paid advertising capabilities. The strongest, most powerful one being Meta, which is the Facebook and Instagram. And it's a lot of the reason why, a big reason why a lot of businesses are still on Facebook is so that they can access the paid advertising. Now, I always say, if you're going to look at paid advertising, you definitely need to have a strong organic, which means unpaid um, foundation of engagement. So you wanna be making sure that you have a strong following already, people are engaging with you and things are working as they should be anyway um, without having to pay for it because paid ads only amplify um, what you've already got. So if you've already got um, you know, a quiet account that's not doing great, you're just gonna be paying for the privilege of having an even quieter account. Whereas if you've got something that people are engaging with, people are enjoying, your paid ad will enhance that as well. Um, it almost needs its own little strategy. Um, I have a client and I feel awful for always bringing up this anecdote, um, anecdote sorry. But he had a podcast that he was hoping to monetize. And the way that he needed to do that was he needed to leverage his um, listening numbers because the higher his listening numbers, the more people would pay to advertise on his podcast. Now, he came to me one day and he said, Cass, I have hacked social media. I know exactly what I need to do. I just need to pay for it. And you might notice if you guys are already on Instagram or Facebook, anytime you post nowadays, Facebook will give you the option to boost that post. And so what he was doing, he was just boosting every post that he had, maybe a five or a day for about three months. And granted, he got a lot of followers and he got a lot of likes. But I asked him, what are your listening numbers like? He said, yeah, funny enough, they've not really changed. So what's the point? You know, if you're putting in all of this money, it's like with any investment, you want to be making sure that you're making a return on it. So creating an ad or um, from scratch rather than boosting random posts, creating specific ads with a specific business goal, you know, bringing it back to that foundation of having a business goal and setting it up accordingly. If he had put up an ad um, saying, you know, last week's episode, we discussed this with a direct link to the episode on Spotify, it would have done really well. But instead he was boosting posts and then people would have needed to see the post, like the post, follow the page, click on the page, click on the link on the bio, click on Spotify, find the episode. No one's gonna be doing that. So you really wanna make things as easy as possible for your user. So that's by setting up your ads strategically. Um, the other great thing about ads is the targeting capabilities because especially with Facebook, that's why it's the most powerful is because the amount of data that Facebook have on us is um, slightly terrifying, borderline immoral, um, but really helpful for businesses because we can tap into that data to really micro-target. So those audiences that you had at the very beginning, um, for instance, if you had a, um, a dog care product, so you had dog accessories or pet accessories or something, in Facebook, you can say, right, I want to put an ad out for 25 to 50 year olds that are interested in dogs and live in um, 50 kilometers outside of Belfast, like within 50 kilometers. Um, you can do even go further. They like, right, I only want um, women and I want them to have uh, a hobby in hockey, for instance. I don't know why you would do that, but it just shows you how specific you can be. Um, so it is really helpful, but remember you need to be strategic and you need to have a solid foundation of organic success first. Influencer marketing. Um, so influencer marketing, it's a big business at the minute. Um, it has a very bad reputation. Uh, mostly because of a lot of teenage girls selling detox tea. Um, but it can really be powerful. If you think of this in the most simplest form, if you have a friend who said, oh, I saw this film in the cinema last week and it was really good. I think you'd really like it. You, sh you should go. 
you're definitely going to listen to that friend more than you would any online reviews of that film. Um, it's it, the basically the beefed up version and you know money making conversion of word of mouth. Um, social media uh, people follow people now that they have no idea who they are. They they just like the lifestyle, and these people have huge followings and a lot of influence. So what it is is partnering with these individuals and getting them to promote your business either through a product or visiting your premises um, and promoting what it is that you're trying to do and you pay or gift them um, things in exchange. Now, if you're looking at influence marketing, there's a few things to think about. Um, there's caveats to each of these, um, these channels. Uh, you wanna make sure one, that they are a genuine influencer in which I mean, they don't, they haven't bought their followers because there are plenty of people on Instagram who might have 20,000 followers that they've just bought. And the easy way to look at this is to look at the likes, the average likes on their posts. So if someone has 20,000 um, followers, but they're only getting maybe 30 or 40 likes on their posts, that is um, not right. You wanna be making sure that they have a strong engagement rate, which is the, average likes that they have on their posts and um, divided by their followers and um, total followers. So a really um, easy hack for this is there, uh, if you just type into Google, um, you know, engagement rate calculator, there will be these sites where you just put in the Instagram um, account name of the person that you are wanting to talk to and it will calculate that person's um, average engagement rate. So you want to make sure it's different depending on the, um, the, the, the following that they have of what kind of engagement rate you want. But really you want to be dealing with people who have at least a 6% engagement rate. So if the number that comes up on that screen is more than 6%, you're good to go um, because they're probably a genuine influencer. The other thing is that you wanna actually make sure that they do content that um, attracts your target audience. So those communities that you identified earlier, you wanna make sure that they have history of creating content for them, history of promoting other businesses for those audiences as well, um, and making sure that it's actually relevant because some influencers again, and these are the ones that give it the bad name, they will just take anything that they can get either for free or for a fee um, and just promote whatever it is. And you don't want that because you want it to be genuine, you want it to be authentic and to fit those brand values that you set out at the beginning um, because People see right through that and they, they, you don't want your brand associated with people like that. Email marketing. So email marketing is another one of my favorites. It's almost like having a VIP list um, that you send love letters to every, every month. Uh, you can do this every two weeks, every month, every quarter, but it's really just cultivating a list of people who are the most engaged um, with your with your business and keeping them feeling like VIPs, you know, sending them exclusive content, sending them little deals, offers, and it's really handy if you've got anything, any specific um, short term business goals or priorities, so that you have, you know, a couple. If you're in accommodation, you have a couple of rooms that are free in two weeks that you just know aren't going to get filled. You go straight to your email list and you say, right, guys, I've got these rooms at this special price first come first serve. So it's great to be able to have this little bubble of people that you can really treat as your VIPs. Um, so the best way to um, build a mailing list is to use what's called a lead magnet. So this can be a couple of different things and you guys have probably signed up to these yourselves and you know them very well. So when you go to maybe an e-commerce website and they'll say, right, give us your email and we'll give you a 10% discount. Now, I know I've done that many times, even though I know what they're doing, I still do it. Um, and that's because it works. And then you're signed up to the mailing list and you aren't able to, um, to you can subscribe at any time, but you can make sure that uh, you're, you're getting that discount as well. So that you can either do that. If you're a service-based business, then you can use a lead magnet to, um, give some information um, for free, enough information that you can afford to give away to get people in. So for instance, on my website, I have an ebook all about hashtags um, and how you can optimize your hashtags. 
So I have that on my website, it's completely free, but people need to sign up to get it delivered to their inbox, but it also gets them onto my mailing list. So it's being able to give something to build that mailing list and then keeping them in there with engaging content because at the end of the day, that's what you want them to be able to see and they can subscribe at any time they can unsubscribe at any time but quite often people actually don't they either one don't want to make the effort to unsubscribe <laughs> um i know that's that's definitely me or they are genuinely invested in the business and want to keep in touch in case there are any deals or promotions that they can get involved in it is also great um and it's a um a more cost efficient way to target your messaging as well because if people are buying specific products, you can put them on specific mailing lists that then um, you can cater the content um, by either what they've bought before or what they're interested in or location. So for instance, you can have a number of different lead magnets. So if I had maybe two different eBooks, one on hashtags and one on um, email marketing, then I know that those two groups of people that have been segmented, segmented are interested in social media and are interested in email marketing. So I can send different content to those different mailing lists. So it's uh, an, another more cost efficient way to, um, to further segment your, your audiences as well. Now your content. So those are all your channels. You can have a look through and go back over these slides and see all the different key considerations. I appreciate it's a lot of information. There's a lot going on in the online world. Um, so have a proper think and reflection of on each of those things, um, what it is that you need to, um, what it is that your audience is going to relate to the most and what you're most comfortable in using. Because again, sorry, just going back even to that email marketing, if you're doing a newsletter once a month, say, you do a little introduction at the beginning. You do, here's this month's blog post from my website, go and click on it. You do a promotion. So here's 10% off this just for email subscribers. And then you do a little bit of content that you had from your social media, like two months ago. That's still relevant um, content. So you don't need to be making all of this new fresh content every single time. You're, as I said about that blog before, about breaking down that blog into social media posts, you are continuously going to be creating content and um, sharing it across your different platforms. But what content are you going to be talking about? So what we have here are what's called content pillars. Now these are themes of posts that direct your planning and help you figure out what it is that you're talking about. So I always suggest having about eight to 10 content pillars. So you can always add variety to what you're talking about. And I'll explain these now, how, how they work. So first of all, the ideal situation that you want to be in, and if we just even take this from a social media perspective, you wanna sit down on a Monday and say, right, I'm gonna do three posts this week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And you're gonna look at your content pillars that have been selected, um, signed off, that's all in line with your digital marketing strategy, all in line with your brand values, in line with who it is that you're talking to and the channels that you're using. So you have your content pillars, right? On the Monday, I'm going to talk about a fun fact of my industry. And on the Wednesday, I'm going to put up a review from that customer two weeks ago. On the Friday, I'm going to put up about my Cyber Monday sale that's gonna be on. And then next week on the Monday, I'm gonna do something um, about that new bit of industry news that's just come out about my industry. Um, on the Wednesday, I'm going to feature that newspaper article that I was in last month. And on the Friday, I'm going to answer a Q&A. So you can plan your content ahead of time using these different content pillars and just keep rotating them um, throughout. And you're never not gonna know what to post and you're always gonna be adding variety. So if you do find there's just one week that you're just so overwhelmed, it's a Friday, you haven't planned anything, you haven't scheduled your content, you can be like, right, I haven't done anything about um my business journey so far in a while so i'm going to post about that time that i did that um specific training um like a couple of weeks ago or something so you always can come back to these content pillars and you always know that there's something there that you can um you can post from so these are just a few examples of um what those content pillars can be 
um, business journey. So, you know, if you've had a lot of training in either professional services or say even you're a yoga teacher and you've had lots of different um, yoga qualifications and training and development, sharing those journeys and sharing that because again it's it's showing that you're invested in your learning and development you're invested in your expertise and that you have that expertise to share so all of these pillars are talking about how great you are without doing the whole billboard look at me I'm amazing this is what I'm doing you're still saying that but in a subtle way and then you've got the behind the scenes everyone loves the behind the scenes of the business and I know there are people who don't want to be the face of the businesses they don't want to come out on camera you don't need to if you just either take pictures or videos of your day to day if you know if you're a crafter or you or you create products just showing the process behind making your products is such a win on social media but being able to show the realities of what it is to run your business um fun facts so bite-sized information about the industry so talking about um different again it's it's that content that you can afford to give away um so you know for instance with with me with social media I always say here's three things you didn't know about hashtags now I know that those three things are out there on the web on the web anyway people can just google it but again it's just showing my expertise and showing the information I'm, I'm giving away because then people it might you know plant a seed and people's minds and all oh, right I can come back to her if I have any other questions so what are some fun facts um that you can give away about your work um that people are interested in uh user generated content it's just a really fancy term for reviews <laughs> and testimonials and maybe even pictures that customers have taken at your premises or of your product um just shoot them a message on Instagram if they put anything up um and just say oh would you mind if we repost it just courteous um offers and sales this is your 20 percent promotional work so everything that we're doing um on social media and on our other channels we want to make sure we have that balance of the billboard hard sell but also the educational helpful inspirational entertaining um content as well and that's what you get from these different pillars um industry news what's going on in your industry you know has a billionaire taken over an entire platform um is that something that you can talk about uh, what are uh, major changes, major legislation, what it means to your customers? Um, what is it that you can talk about to show that you're in the know, to, again, that you're invested in your learning and development and that you are an expert in your area? Again, it's showing your expertise. Um, press opportunities. If you've um, managed to get any external media coverage um, and the uh, newsletter, uh, sorry, um, newspaper articles, magazines, podcasts, anything in um, the more media and PR world uh, that you can share. Because again, especially um, what's called earned coverage. So, you know, coverage in a magazine that you haven't paid for. It again shows that these major publications have said that I'm worthy enough to be in their um, publication. So therefore, I am an expert. And again, I'm telling you how great I am without saying it myself. So linking to any any media and PR that you've got. And then two-way communication. This is, I think, is the most important. Um, this is um, basically keeping an eye on how people are reacting to your content and using any information you can get from that to then um, inspire you to create that content in future. And I'll give you an example. Um, if I say, coming back to hashtags, I post three things you didn't know about hashtags. Someone might comment, this is so much like such great information, Cassie. Thank you so much. How many hashtags do you think we should use in a post? And I'll answer that straight away, just in the comments, but I'll put that on my list and I'll be like, right, when I'm next planning my content, I'm going to do a post on how many hashtags should I be using in a post? So it's looking at these little Q and A's um, and reactions um, to your content and then being able to harness them for the content ideas moving forward. Because again, it's authentic. People will know that you're listening to them. And it's one less thing that you have to think up of. Um, so that's really handy. Um, so the ideal situation you want to be in is you are sitting down on a Monday, as I said, um, and you're putting an hour aside and you're planning, creating, and scheduling your posts for that week or for the next two weeks. Or if you go pro, you can do it once a month. So sit down on Monday, take the whole uh, morning off, sit down, look at your content pillars, plan out every day that you're going to post and then create either the photo the graphic 
the caption and just schedule it all out. So scheduling platforms with Meta, you've got Meta Business Suite. So do all of your scheduling on that. Um, Twitter, you can schedule tweets in Twitter only on the desktop, I believe. You can't do them on the phone. Um, and even LinkedIn has just brought out a scheduling platform as well um, on the platform. You don't want to be using any third party schedulers. The fact that these um, business, these companies have put in their own scheduling platform means that they want to keep everything in house. So make sure that you keep everything on the platform. Um, but scheduling out is really important because that's where we get our time efficiency. If you sit down on a Monday and you do one hour and your three posts are done and they're just going to go out like clockwork and you don't need to worry about it. What you do need to do is maybe just check in with your social social media, um, maybe five or 10 minutes a day and just chat away to your community. So people that you follow, commenting on their posts, responding to any comments or messages that you get on your social media profiles. And just it's just conversation at the end of the day. That's what social media started as. It's conversation. And as businesses, we need to be really careful about how we infiltrate that personal space. Um, with that balance of helpful and promotional content. Brilliant. 11.45, oh, sorry, 10.45 for you guys. I mean, I'm an hour ahead of you. Um, so we will be taking some questions for the next half hour. Oh, Claire, you're muted. All right. Um, I said, great, Cathy, and we've been inundated with questions um, in the Q&A and in the chat. So what I'll do is I'll just fire them to you and we can try Let's to go. as them live as possible. So I did what, see that number going up and I was starting to get very nervous. <laughs> um, what would be best in terms of B2B businesses using LinkedIn to grow the company page? Yeah, so LinkedIn, if you're doing anything B2B um, or a more professional service, LinkedIn is the way to go. So again, it's looking at your audience. And so if your audience are a specific business or you're targeting professional people, for instance, um, LinkedIn is definitely the channel that you need to be on. Um, and yeah, company page, definitely. But also looking at your personal brand um, because you never know when you might pivot into something else or you might be changing careers, changing jobs, whatever it is. Um, so you need to make sure you have a history of a strong personal brand as well as um, the company page on LinkedIn. So making sure your profile is sharp with a decent headshot. Yeah. Um, and just on, on that one as well, we we're going to be sending out a catalog, a link to the catalog of all the um, previous Transform Your Business webinars. And there is a specific one um, on LinkedIn, which is led by Louise Brogan, who's a LinkedIn um, expert. So it might be useful um, to watch again um, at that webinar um, yeah. just, um, for, for, for your use. So would you recommend outsourcing your digital marketing, you know, social media and ad strategy? Um, if you can afford to, it's great because um, again, it's one less thing you want to do once as your business is growing you want to be delegating the, your things that you don't want to be spending time on or the things that you know just know aren't your strong points um outsourcing to expertise if you can if it's within budget i would suggest it um i'm a strategist because i tend to um look after clients who can't outsource it or won't, don't want to outsource it and want to keep creative control um which is why i upskill um owners directly um but if you can um, and you want to definitely outsource um Okay, so on that one, I'm gonna. There's another question and for, further down, but it's kind of it's very it's it it relates to it. Um, I find creating content such as blogs difficult and time consuming. I did hire a digital media agency to do it, but I felt that they did not understand my business enough to write interesting content. Watch mm. it. It is tough when you have a specific business and you're in a specific niche because, um, you know, at the end of the day digital marketing agencies specialize in digital marketing. They don't specialize in your subject. Um, so what you can do is have a look on these freelancer websites like Fiverr um, or Upwork who will have um, people who are copywriters and you can see the copywriters from specific industries. So you might be able to have more luck outsourcing to freelancers like that who have experience either in your business or in your industry um, that can be quite handy and again you're not having to 
it sign on to any contracts or anything it's freelancers it's quite breezy in terms of the payments and um and you know the transactions of it um so have a have a look through some of those freelancer websites because there are some real interesting specialists and you know there are people there's there's so many freelancers on there so there's bound to be someone who specializes in your area and can get um, that expertise and that tone of voice down a lot better and be able to relate to your customers a lot better. Yeah, and it's also useful for businesses, you know, um, taking part on webinars such as this, because mm -hmm. if you have a clear idea around what your goals are, what you want to achieve, maybe what type of content and messages that you want to deliver, that'll make that easier to. Yeah. Orders. Yeah, the brief is really important, and yeah. the more that the more that you can articulate in the brief, and um, the easier it is going to be for the person writing. Um, how do you measure success, and how do you balance the time spent and return on investment? In terms of monetary value, it's it can be quite difficult. I think it's obviously easier on things like paid advertising when you're putting specific money, uh, specific numbers in, and getting specific numbers out. Um, and there's some really fancy things that you can do now in terms of tracking ads and consumer behavior and, you know, website pixels and things like that. Um, if you're wanting to go in that space, hiring or outsourcing to an expert is really helpful for that because you can make it quite clear. Um, in terms of everyday usage, um, it is hard, hard to measure success monetary. I think really it comes back to those overarching business goals and just keeping track on how you're measuring you know define your own term term of success um because it's going to be different for everyone anyway and then just keep an eye not on just how you're doing with the social media but then how you're doing in the overarching business and being able to track that um and you'll be able to almost work out your own form of success just through tracking um i find that any in terms even if it's things like client acquisition and then seeing where those clients are coming from. So, you know, you, people have probably filled in these forms, like, where did you hear from us? Like, that is just them tracking their success. Um, did you hear us from a Google ad? Did you find us on Google? Um, family or friends, social media. If you're picking social media, then they know that their social media is working. Um, so also, by the way, just as a courtesy, if you ever do get those pop-ups, like, do actually fill them in because they're really helpful for other businesses. Um, but you can use that kind of tracking in your own business too. Um, from your experience, where would you spend the bulk of your digital strategy budget? Um, so I think the biggest budget now goes to paid ads because everything else you can do pretty organically. Um, social media on its own without paid ads is obviously free. Um, in terms of things like email marketing, um, you know, you pay maybe a monthly or an annual fee to a subscription service um but that doesn't change no matter how big your your mailing list gets so that's normally pretty standard influencer marketing is um it is so hard to kind of generalize because it can be so specific to the influencer some smaller influencers will ex accept gifted um things others will insist on a fee and it's really hard to gauge how much you pay people again it's just i think down to negotiations between the two of what you what you're happy to have as a budget um again making sure that the brief is really specific um and seeing um how you can track your analytics with the influencer as well to try and get some kind of sense of website clicks or something from from a post so i would say the majority of digital marketing spend would go on paid advertising okay and then um how often would you recommend posting on social media and how many for email marketing so when it comes to social media, it's not so much how often you post, it's picking a number and sticking to it. Because if you say, right, I'm going to post every single day, and then you miss like three or four days, you are going to lose your momentum and you're going to lose that consistency and you're going to get out off balance. I always suggest the saying, right, let's start with three times a week, really nail that workflow, nail on a sitting on a Monday and scheduling three posts a week every week. Once you've got that, build it up to four. Once you're really, really confident and happy with that and you're getting that consistency, build up to five times a week. Um, I don't think there's any need for businesses to post on a weekend, um, maybe unless you're in the hospitality and you've got stuff going on or events or something like that. But if you're professional services or um, 
anything like that. Like I don't bother posting on a weekend, so I post every weekday. But yeah, it's starting off small and getting yourself confident and building up um, because consistency and quality of content is definitely more important than, than the quantity. Um, in terms of email marketing, um, again, it's down to your capacity. Um, don't be pushing yourself um, to do it too often if you don't think it can be consistent. Um, one, an email once a month um, is great. Um, again, you know, you're infiltrating people's inboxes, so you don't want to be giving them fatigue. I do once every two weeks. Um, and that's just, again, a nice balance of what my capacity is and what I want to be able to provide um, and how often I want to be in people's inboxes. Yeah, and that goes back to, you know, when you say about um, infiltrating people's inboxes, it's the content that you're delivering to them. So, you know, is it something that's of use to them? Yeah. If it's something that's of use to them, then they want you to come into their inbox yeah. and, and they want to consume that information. But if you're just promoting or it's like a blanket um, kind of content that, that really isn't hitting um, what the consumer needs. So, again, it's all, you know, email marketing, it's kind of looking at, your different segments and, and targeting kind of depending on the messages as well so I, I mm -hmm. think email one isn't it it's a bit kind of difficult to say with a you know what strategy you should be you know should it be every two weeks or every four yeah so you're emailing you have you have clients Cassie um and you're emailing them with kind of updates or you're emailing them with um kind of content tips and things like that you know things that they mm -hmm. will utilize um but if you're emailing um say you're delivering a workshop on god i don't know you know i suppose it really depends on who's in your email list have they subscribed to your email list and you know what content it is that, that you're giving them isn't, that's important too isn't it yeah exactly exactly that which brings me there's a question on this and i'm not sure whether you will be able to answer it but i'll pose it to you anyway is gdpr an issue if i'm doing email marketing from a database i have compiled it's really hard to answer um, that and on. yeah <laughs> so um i am not a specialist in gdpr um having a solid privacy policy on your website is super important and having it accessible on your website is super important so people understand um what it is that you're doing um and how their data is being used um, and if you can, I think it is really worth just to make that watertight and just get um, a GDPR expert, privacy expert. I had one look over my privacy policy um, just to make sure everything was above the board. Yeah, and then for email lists, it's making sure as well that people have subscribed to get. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Just not importing mailing lists, uh, yeah. importing emails from. So again, some of the questions yeah. can answer kind of a blanket approach, but some we we, re, we require further details on the type of business um, and what it is that you're doing. So um, bear with us for that one. Yeah. So I have a cookery school and so I have lots of content for social media posts. How frequently would you suggest I post? I have lots of likes and views on my posts, but I struggle to convert them into bookings for courses. OK, so I mentioned there about the frequency in terms of just um, building up small and keep going as much as your capacity. Um, in terms of conversion, this is um, this is what everyone, everyone wants to know. And again, it's not an easy answer. It's more making sure one that you have, you make it really clear how people book on to your next um, course or um, your next event. So even small things like in, in your captions, making sure you're finishing off every post saying, if you're interested in learning more, then book onto this course that we have on this date. The link is found in my bio or something like that. You just, it's the small things of making it really, really clear um, what it is that you want people to do next. Because if you do have people that are bought into your content, they're like, oh, this is cool. I'm going to follow this person. It's also something like in your, um, in your bio on Instagram or Facebook or LinkedIn or whatever, even in your description, making it crystal clear what you want people to do next. So find out more information, go to this website to sign up for my course. You, I, it, it is good to be more specific. So to find to sign up to our next event, um, click here, things like that. So the call to action is you need to make sure that you're doing in order to initiate that conversion. Um, and then after that, it's it's really just looking at how things are working and tracking your analytics to see what 
is making the most conversions. Most of the time, if you have a social media post and you look at your insights, you can see how many people will click on your website after looking at that post. So keeping an eye on that, for the content that gets the most conversions, have a look at that content. Are there any particular learnings you can take from it? Um, is there anything in this that was different from the others? And it's just a good old fun experiment from there. And another question, and what type of content is best real static photograph or... um de depends on the platform um i mean assuming you mean instagram if you're saying reels um reels are really like video content is really strong at the minute um especially on instagram reels will get you more organic reach so again reach that you're not paying for um then then static posts um mostly because they're trying to compete with TikTok. Um, so if you do have the um capability and the content to create reels, do give them a go um because they are worth it and um, they do get you more reach. And it can be you don't need to think or over um complicate them, even if you just have um you know some B-roll content on your phone that you've got um from an event or something that you that you are at and you know putting insightful um short messaging um in front of you know background videos and um, things like that um to sh still share your expertise um and to share your message can be really helpful um so reels are i'm sorry to say they are great are tools like hootsuite useful so <sighs> I think Hootsuite is useful if you are a larger company with multiple accounts, um, multiple um, moderation um, needs. Uh, it can be really useful for that. In terms of a daily scheduler, as I mentioned, you don't want to be scheduling on anything that's not the platform itself. And they develop those tools specifically to keep you in app. Um, so do make use of them. I've experimented with this and I found that when I was posting on a third party scheduler rather than um, Meta itself, there was a huge drop in my engagement and in my reach. So I would definitely just using um, using the in-house schedulers when possible. Um, so this one, it's an opinion piece and you may not want to answer on a recorded webinar. Um, what is your opinion of the Gary Lineker issue? How can I or should I control my staff, what my staff post on social media? Um, I think in terms of the Gary Lineker issue, I think, yeah, oof, I think he, he was, he's right to share his opinions. At the end of the day, people are people, um, they have lives outside of work. Um, and I think you can't control what your staff are putting out on their social media. You don't have the legislative right to. However, in terms of what they're posting about at work or about your brand that you can have some control over. Um, and it's again, just having the relationship with your staff to know what is okay, what's not okay um, without, um, you know, the, the whole um, censoring sense. You don't want to be telling them what not to do. You can just say, look, in terms of anything at work or about us or about the business if um just l let me see it first even you know there are some people on tiktok who um employees of clothes shops um who have just personal brands but just take them all the time at work talking about their jobs as shop assistants now those those tiktoks do really really well and people find them funny and engage with them and it does naturally draw um, and generate interest about the shop that they're in um, and they've said before that they show their boss everything they put before they go out. And if there's anything he's not happy with, he can veto. So again, it's creating that relationship with your employees, but they shouldn't really be posting about work at work. Um, yeah. yeah and it's all, in terms all, of personal opinions, you've got no legislative right to control what they say, and neither did the BBC. That's all yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's also useful you have a social media policy in place um as part of you know as yeah. part of your kind of employee handbook um so it kind of outlines what what it is, is is your kind of terms of engagement um in terms of social media so that would probably be a useful thing to include um how do i counteract trolling 
never respond because you responding um, is exactly what they want. Um, and it's just going to generate more trolling. Um, the best thing to do is just delete and block if there's anything that you don't like. Um, and, you know, most of the time now these companies can distinguish when the same person is creating a new account and can block them automatically. So that's good. But never respond um, because it, that's exactly what they're going for. Um, so just delete and block and move on with your day because they live a sad existence. Okay, what is the best time of day to post as the algorithms can impact on when people see a post? Any tips on what we can do to mitigate this or to use yeah. it? You want to be posting when your audience is most active. Um, so you can have a look at your insights um, and you'll be able to see little charts of when your clients are most active. Um, when you're scheduling things in um, things like business, um, uh, meta business suite, they'll often tell you um, optimized times um, and they'll give you suggestions. Um, always take their suggestions because that's obviously what, why they're telling you it and it's when your audience is most active. Um, so you do want to be, um, and if you don't have, so sometimes when you have less than a hundred followers on Instagram, you won't get access to those insights yet because they don't have enough data. Um, so kind of good starting point is just to do it around six, seven o'clock in the evening when people are all on their phones in the evening, um, until you get past that hundred follower mark and then you get, um, clearer insights, but it is mostly the evenings. There's one here, what sorts of insights, blog topics do you think would be best to write for your website and then post about on social media? And again, I suppose that depends on the type of business or the products or services that you're offering. But depends on the business. Um, it's really just, it's um, a larger view of that, give the information that you can afford to give away. Um, and so look at your content pillars for that I, that I put here, um, because those are going to be handy um, idea generators. Um, but it is really just thinking about, you know, the different services that you offer. And again, looking at frequently asked questions. So what do people want to know about um, when they're asking before they sign up with you or before they pay you or before they buy? Like, what is it that they normally, what's their thinking process and what information can you give to make that decision for them and make that information accessible? So um, yeah, it's really, Getting in the getting in the shoes of your customer and see what they want to know, um, and what you want to be able um, or what you can afford to, what information you can afford to give away. Okay, thank you. And what advice would you have about creating a sales funnel? Ah, uh, not quite a big question. <laughs> I think um, again accessibility. So it's making the journey as easy as possible, um, and just making sure that you have a clear customer journey and making sure that everything that they need to go on that journey is as accessible and as easily directed and signposted by you as possible. Yeah, it's kind of that creating the awareness, isn't it? Yeah. Um, of your brand or what the product is and then kind of then kind of building that up, create the interest um, so that the customer, potential customer becomes interested in what it is that you're selling and then making it desirable so something that they're going to want to um mm -hmm. you know want to want to purchase at a later date so it's all that kind of building the momentum isn't it That's yeah exactly exactly um and then is a chat about the future for creating content for socials it's just so interesting because this so this is quite big at the minute with oh, chat cool. gbt yeah, um, yeah. and, and it's like when I first saw it, I, I, I was, I was terrified. I had a friend who showed it to me first. Um, but it, it is interesting because it, it, it can be so useful. Um, and I think everyone was scared of, oh, it's going to put everybody out of jobs. Um, but, or, you know, doctors are going to pass their qualifications with chat GPT before they hit the operating table. Like that's not going to be the case. So I think it will be interesting to see in terms of an educational point of view, how they do manage that, you know, things like schools and universities and stuff like that. Um, but I think in terms of day-to-day -day business and content creation, you know, when Canva came out, which is the graphic designing platform, Canva came out about 10 years ago. Um, and everyone was like, oh my God, this is the end of graphic designers or designers as we know. 
and there is still bad um graphics created on Canva and there is still a dire need for graphic designers and the same is going to be for writing um and for content creation and for captions like you, you only get as good as you can put in with AI bots and you know especially with chat GBT like the way that that is programmed I believe doesn't have too much information after 2021 anyway so most of the information that's getting in there is some well in terms of the social media perspective quite outdated already and um, because it changes you know weekly um in social media but i think the, the real strength of ai is when um it's idea generation just writer's block if you are struggling one day and you are like going to your content pillars and you're like right I've got to do a top tip about my industry and my brain is just not working today. I've got no idea what to do. If you put in a prompt in chat GBT being like, write me a list of 10 content ideas of, um, as a, to promote my business as a yoga teacher. And it will generate a list of 10 ideas. Those are just ideas that you can then take. And it can sometimes be the absolute difference between you not knowing what to do at all and you being like, oh, of course, I can write about that. And then you just go ahead and write. Um, in terms of things like blog posts as well, you can do that for blog idea generation. I didn't want to mention that before, but that is, that, that is definitely a way that people get um, blog post ideas. Write me a list of 10 blog post ideas about my, um, for my architectural business. Like that, that is something that can be really, really helpful. Um, and again, even it gets, quite scary because you can literally say to chat GBT, write me a blog post about the need for content surveying until I'm I know what I'm talking about there um and it will write a blog post and it will sound good but again you're not wanting to put that up on your website because especially um search engines like Google are now going to be equipping themselves with AI detectors um, to be able to detect which websites are heavily using AI and which ones are using organic content. And people will always, these companies will always be pushing organic content. So again, whilst it might be able to help you with some inspiration, idea generation, even if you see what they, how they would write it, um, you might then be like, oh, like that bit's good, but I would do this completely differently. And you'll end up writing something completely different. So Again, it's just, a, it's a good starting point and a good time-saving exercise, but it's not going to completely replace organic content. Okay, and then finally, you touched earlier on influencer marketing. Mm -hmm. um, and someone has asked the question, can you get your family and friends to be influencers for you? Yeah, so it's, you know, influencers are anyone, like we're, we're all influencers, you know, as I said, it's that word of mouth. So. If you've got friends and family, like they should be sharing about your business anyway. Um, so definitely any kind of word of mouth. And, you know, that's the whole point of really creating that community um, and building that base of loyal customers. Because at the end of the day, you want them all to be your influencers. Influencer marketing is just when you pay someone to do it. It's a very cold transaction. Whereas what you want to be doing is that real authentic, oh, I went to this great place the other day. You should definitely try it out. Like that's what you want. It's hard to it's hard to beat the the word of mouth and the kind of the, it's the strongest marketing. Business. Strongest marketing um channel. <laughs> no, amazing. And you know what? We could probably sit here all day with lo lots and lots of questions, but um, we are well, quickly if rolling. Anyone out. needs me, that's my QR codes to my LinkedIn if anyone wants to connect or get any other information. Um, let me let me know. And Cassie, you also run you have a a, a group, like a private group that people can yeah. see, don't you? So I have um, a made a media members group. Um really did myself a favor with that naming. Um <laughs> get muddled up in it. Um and this is just a Facebook group. You can either um buy an annual subscription of um to gain access and it can be a 24 seven Q and A machine. Um, so you put in any question anytime um, and I'll answer straight away. I also do free um, live Q and A's um, every month. So for 30 minutes, we'll sit down on the Zoom like this and we just do back and forth Q and A's. Um, if you sign up uh, for one of my client services, you get access to that group for free. Um, but otherwise you can just get a paid subscription into it. 
No, that's great. Um, with so much content and food for thought, um, the oil read really does flying by. Or it does. <laughs> Um, but that brings us to the end of today's webinar and officially the end of our Transform Your Business program suite of support, sadly. Um, but fear not, because ourselves and the council will keep you all updated with all future upcoming opportunities for your business in the borough. Um, so behalf, on behalf of Innovate NI, myself and my colleague Barney Toole and the ABC council team, Elaine Cullen and Ronan McNally, I'd like to sincere, sincerely thank Cassie. Um, for the deep dive into creating digital media strategy today and to all of you in the audience for being part of the Council's Transform Your Business programme of support. Um, so that just leaves me to sign off um, from our final webinar. Um, so happy Friday, everybody, and have a great weekend. <laughs>